events, and then G events 4325. Capital G. <laughs> And does everyone have PuTTY or, or like SSH if you're on yeah, PuTTY if you're Windows? Do not use all that? G events and G events four three two five. Space. We have uh, some good air conditioning going on. People that have come see me before know I'm like paranoid about air conditioning. It's it's actually one of the hardest things on a weekend, especially 
uh, especially in like San Francisco, some of the, you know these like older buildings, they just shut it off. And to have right, like the AC on uh, right, like after 5 p.m. or on the weekends is like thousands, like tens of thousands of dollars. So. Um, yeah. So let's see. I think what I'm going to do to start, I found that like this is the best over the last few times I've done this, is to do one big demo at the beginning, right? Like who came to the meetup the other night prior to saw this? Okay, yeah, a few people. Um, the demo I'm going to show is the exact demo that we're each going to build locally, or well, yeah, locally on the uh, cloud instance. So let me go through the demo first, and then I'm going to give you guys the credentials. Because what I found is when I give you guys the credentials to the server and I give you uh, the page, there's like a million links you can click, and, and, and no one really pays attention to me. So um, let's start off by. Actually, I guess I'll start introducing myself first. It's the one thing I always forget. Okay, who am I? Yeah, so Chris Fregley, that's my name. Uh, from Chicago. Where am I kept at? Um, yeah, was in Chicago for a number of years. Uh, I hate to say it, but the Chicago tech market's not not like Seattle, not like San Francisco. They've been trying to make the Silicon Prairie uh, happen for years and years, and that name alone is just horrible. Um, so finally moved to San Francisco about five years ago, six years ago now, I guess. Uh, my buddy got me a job at uh, like Netflix, so that kind of started my career here um, on the West Coast. Uh, my friend made me this emoji sticker here. Yeah, I'll leave some of them out. I don't. Yeah, no one really wants them. Um, I like it. I think it's kind of funny, but it's funny when I'm sitting in a bar, a restaurant, working, and yeah, after about an hour, the bartender is like, "Wait, like, is that you on there?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm a douchebag." That's okay. Certified douchebag. Um, yeah, started this company recently, Pipeline IO. Sounds like something you guys were already asking my buddy Andy about what we're doing there. Um, I'm going to point out, you know, this is totally not a sales pitch for my company. In fact, we're, we're kind of in stealth, but. I can't really uh, keep a secret, so I, I end up telling people uh, the exact stuff that we're working on. So I'll sort of highlight the really trouble spots that I see with these data pipelines, these machine learning pipelines, and, and, and sort of where people tend to stop, you know, which I'll just kind of give you a hint is, is when that model is trained, right? But then when you do it the model, right? So that's where pipeline O kind of kicks in. Uh, I'll show some code generation, you know, things where we'll take a decision tree and actually really generate code out of that. Uh, or like optimized Java code. It's not quite optimized yet, but that's the plan. Yeah, I'll show you guys kind of how we're doing it. Um, and then the ability to put that behind, uh, really not necessarily Tomcat, but if you think of Tomcat or some sort of web server or, or like web server like that, that's kind of the concept. Um, for Pipeline IO's case, we're going to be we are using Netflix uh, like open source, just because I'm you know, very familiar with the uh So I'll, I'll point out a lot of. It. Those components there. That way we can, you know, point like Chaos Monkey at these, probably right, like these, or like ML model servers, I guess you would call them. Um, I'll tend to really talk about the whole serving layer, um, which, I guess, so just to make it clear, it's it's the actual right, like user facing layer that's calling in to get predictions, right? Serving or the prediction layer, uh, people call it different things. Uh, TensorFlow just came out with TensorFlow serving. Well, back in November, it was early January. Which kind of highlighted that term. Um, really, you know, Spark, really to date, has done nothing about uh, the Spark, the Spark, the really ML model survey. It's more about training. and Everyone gets excited, and then uh, my time. Yes, I worked at like Databricks as well. Let me keep going here. Um, at Databricks, I saw this all the time. People would, uh, you know, really train their model. They'd use the Databricks product. Everything's cool. They'd be using Spark. Everything's cool. But now, what do they do with it? So people tend to hack up these Python Flask servers and um, you know, things like that. So that's just going to be one part um, of the workshop is actually deploying these things. Uh, look, yes, most of it's going to be the training and building up. Uh, San Francisco, I have this uh, the advanced Spark 
uh, and TensorFlow Meetup. Um, so we have about, I think, 4,000 members now. Uh, we, we do about one a month, maybe two a month, sometimes, depending on who's in town. Uh, this is actually about the one-year anniversary of when, I think it was July 28th was the actual first meetup. Yeah, I founded it, or I actually hit the create button the meetup on July 1st, but uh, it was, yeah, July 28th was the first one, so uh, it's kind of fun. One year later, um, I've got, oh yeah, one thing about this meetup, the reason I have the, that first word up there, the advance, we tend to go straight into code, right? Like we don't, you know, yeah, there's like use cases and you know, the sort of business and things like that, but there's so much of that, right? And um, yeah, I personally was just kind of tired and really like the Bay Area specifically, uh, I just wanted more you know, code and detail and things like that. When I would go to a meetup, I would spend, you know, two hours after this long day, I wanted to but not, not uh, like a bunch of use cases that uh, don't apply to me. So, let's see. Some of the, uh, this material, this uh, really GitHub repo that we'll be working out of actually kind of started for my book, uh, which isn't out yet, but I was sort of loosely waiting for Spark 2.0. Yeah, that was my excuse. Yes, I was actually happy when Spark 2.0 kept getting delayed because it meant I didn't have to actually do anything until it got released. So that'll be tightening up here in the next couple months. Uh, I've got this funny mockery. I worked on the initial Smack stack last year, um, actually around this time. Uh, sort of mocked it. Uh, yeah, like one year later, pancake stack. The sort of idea here is that uh, think beyond just Spark, right? And right, like, don't think about Mesos, just kind of forget about Mesos, right? Uh, what was the A? Akka? Yeah, I mean, but yeah, I don't really use Akka. So A, I have three opportunities for A here, not a single one one's Akka. Uh, yeah, Mesos, it, it didn't fit into pancake stack, you don't spell it within, within M, you spell it within N, so uh, stuck in an I5 there. Um, but things that we'll rather learn from rather places like Netflix is that Spark isn't the only person on the block, right? Kid on the block. So, you know, Presto has its advantages. Spark is rather general purpose. Yes, I hate to bust your bubble, but, you know, I'm going to talk crap about Spark. I'm going to talk crap about pretty much rather, like, everyone in my life. Like, you know, my brother and my sister. Uh, yeah, this is my time to, to be uh, rather like, video filmed and uh, rather making fun of these people. Co-workers and stuff. Um, there's a time and a place for Cassandra um, at like Netflix. We have this problem where we were always trying to fit Cassandra into every single use case, even uh, like generating sequence numbers and things like that, which Cassandra is just uh, horrible about. Um, let's see. We'll show. I used to be pretty Elasticsearch heavy in sort of the like early days of, of this project. Um, but I've since kind of switched over to Redis, which doesn't look like it's in Pancake Stack. But yeah, Redis is actually a pretty important part. And that came from just studying other uh, rather places architectures and uh, sort of going back to Netflix. Um, they actually use more rather like memcache. Um, there's, there's slowly some teams are switching over to use Redis for their caching layer. But if you think of rather like sort of offline generating of like recommendations, right? So there's this, this huge nightly job that's generating uh, recommendations for right, like 120 people or whatever, and then sticking that into this gigantic right, like memcache cluster. That's cross-region and cross everywhere. Um, and yeah, they're so confident right, like about their implementation um, of memcache and how they're using it that they don't even have persistence lines. It's, it's, it's replicated three different regions with uh, right, like three or four different availability zones all throughout the world. Uh, it's pretty unlikely that one entire right, region will go down, um, or sorry, that, that all three regions will go down. It's fairly likely that actually one region will go down, and that did happen, uh, I think, Christmas 2012 or something. Yeah, because that was on call every day. Um, we'll do some sediment analysis, things like that with Stanford Core and LP. We'll talk about uh, right, like things like approximations using algebra. If we're trying to right, like maintain huge counts, right, like counts that uh, won't fit onto a right, like single server, so they yeah, have to be distributed and then have to be uh, count in such a way that the data structure is super duper small. So yeah, we'll show examples of that. Um, yeah, so right, like before this, I was a researcher, solution engineer, whatever. Uh, the IBM Spark Tech Center started up uh, actually about this time last year. 
Um, I jumped ship from Databricks over to here, uh, helped build this up. I think we were five people when I started, probably built up to about 60. Um, it was actually pretty easy, right? I mean, this is IBM, they have a lot of money. Uh, this is Spark, and this group was dedicated to Spark. So I mean, I kind of brag how I read, like, helped raise it up from five to 60, but it's like, yeah, it like, really wasn't that hard. You go speak some more and you get six resumes and you yeah, hire two of them, right? So, um, yeah, pretty good gig going on there. Uh, before that, data solutions engineer at Databricks. Um, yeah, what did I call these guys? The khaki people? And then uh, Databricks, the Spark people. So you guys have created it. Uh, did my year there. Um, let's see. Yeah, so field engineer, this is where we saw quite a lot of implementations. Um, yeah, so Databricks has their own notebook product. Uh, we didn't actually work with a lot of uh, like customers on site or anything like that. All of the work that like, we did was uh, with the probably Databricks notebook product, which is um, powered by Spark, of course. One sort of interesting thing to note about Databricks uh, product right now, anyway, is that it's just Spark, right? If you look at like other uh, like products like Qubole, Q-U-B-O-L-E, or like Platform, these guys have more than just Spark. They have Presto support, right? They, yeah, they support multiple clouds, right? So um, it's one sort of you know slight ding on or like Databricks and, and yeah, at the time I was trying to get them to think more, uh, to go beyond, but you know, um, if, if you think about a startup, they have to stay focused, have to uh, really do that thing, or else they end up in or like tech crunch, being known as the people that try to do too much as a startup, so. Um, yeah, so I've got a lot of good war stories I'll share with you from Databricks, um, of course IBM, and of course Netflix, uh, the streaming video people, I was on the streaming team there, basically getting data in so that the data scientists could then run their models and build uh, recommendations and find clusters and things like that. So we'll go over some of those techniques here. Okay. Um, I think I sent this in the email if you guys got it. The repo that we'll be working out of um, primarily, this is all open source. Yeah, this entire workshop is, uh, could be done on your own if you want. Um, and right, like when you leave, you can actually follow these steps. So I've already done step one for you guys. Yes, I'm about to shoot out the big email with all of your guys' IP addresses and some of the login and that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, you can actually follow this. You can do it on Amazon. I just happened to choose GCE today, uh, just because of price. Um, I can get I can get the same server, uh, the, the same eight core, 50 gig, right, like no for each person um, for. Uh, or like, yeah, it's like $10 cheaper or something per day. It's not yeah, that big of a deal. But yeah, I also want some experience with uh, GCE, which I had never done before, because uh, it was pretty much all Amazon, right? Like Databricks is all Amazon, Netflix is all Amazon. I'm sure you guys are all Amazon being up here. Uh, the key always is the firewall rules. To make this easy, I just open them all up. This is going to mortify some of you uh, right, like DevOps people out there, some of you security conscious people. Um, yeah, I mean, lock it down as you wish. Uh, can't, can't make any guarantees. I do have a list of all the ports. It's actually in the main Docker file. So this is all Dockerized too. That's how, that's how we actually get it onto each of those instances that uh, right, like we're all going to get. Um, let's see. Yeah, so Windows people, I've got the PPK ready for you so that you can SSH in. So this is what we're going to build. So this is the same uh, right, like architecture diagram I presented the other night at the meetup Thursday night. There's no like, prerequisite. I didn't have to be there Thursday night. I just feel bad for some of those people that, that were there because they're going to hear some of the same jokes and things like that. Um, so what we've got going on here is we're going to build this, this app here. Um, So this is like a sample, I don't know, I kind of really jokingly call it a dating site. It's called Spark After Dark. This is uh, like part of my book example, um, which one publisher was completely mortified by. They, they would not ever even touch a you know, dating site for their book example. But these dating sites actually do quite a lot. And uh, in terms of generating 
rather similars and recommendations and like using images to actually make recommendations. If you've been liking this, this type of person, then we're going to make recommendations to you based on the actual or like eigenvectors and you know, things like that from, from these, these flattened out images. So I've got examples of all these. Um, I've got some stuff about NLP, right, the ability to actually uh, read into messages that people are, you know, are like sending to each other, um, which is a complete violation of uh, privacy, but it's fine because I, I want these recommendations, I guess. Um, but yeah, the ability to, you know, find like engrams and, and people that, that send emails to people and that email that they wrote has a lot of the profile, that, of the target person's profile, right, like these emails get like buffed up. These are like high priority emails, meaning the sender actually took time, right? Like took uh, and you know, yes, yeah, so actually read through and, and uh, just didn't type like hey or whatever. Okay, so we're gonna build this. Um, if you guys actually could right now, could you go to demo.pipeline.io? Actually, don't click anything yet on that page. But you will be clicking on that page in a sec. What I'm, I'm doing here, uh, typing madly, is What you'll find um, yeah, in this workshop is that there's so much going on, there's so many moving parts that uh, really don't get too freaked out by errors, and, you know, warnings and stack traces and things like that. Yeah, I know that's kind of the natural reaction, but think of a production system like a real world system where you can't possibly squash every single error that you find. You just kind of start to learn to ignore certain ones. So um, I'll point those out to you guys, uh, explain you know, why they're sort of uh, non-fatal. Okay, so what I just did was I started up this Spark streaming job here, okay? Uh, so when we click on people up here, so I've asked you guys to kind of click on, uh, you know, find, find three actresses, three, three male actors uh, that you would go have a drink with, all right? It has nothing to do with, if you're married, yeah, don't, you know, don't be shy here. This is all for technology's sake. Um, I'm not going to tie this back to, you know, I'm not going to send this to your, your spouse or anything. Okay, so what's happening there, and I should actually see some lips, yeah. So as you guys are clicking, um, if, if you guys could do me one favor too and not click on these things at the top. I actually thought I removed those from the demo, but um, just, just click on these people for right now because, uh, and then, We'll get into what all these are. So this is every rating that you make. Yes, I'm calling these ratings. This is uh, the, your like unique ID right here that was generated, right? So I was number uh, 60280, so I should see you in a sec here. 60280 right there. So Spark Streaming is out here pulling every, I think, two seconds or something like that. Each time that you click, just to give you guys context, there is a view source here. We're actually posting uh, to the Kafka REST API. So just to kind of map the UI, here's where I'm actually making AJAX call, just post this rating. The key, um, key so yeah, we'll talk about this when we talk more about Kafka, but the key in Kafka um, helps define which partition, right? So think of a like distributed system, rather like Cassandra. Um, uh, there's rather multiple servers out there. We're trying to figure out which server to go to, but we want all of the same keys to go to the same server, of course, right? So the key in this case is uh, this unique ID. Uh, right, 
right here. So that's the user ID. And then the values, um, we're actually passing the, the, the uh, key twice here. So once to be used by Kafka, and then once as part of the payload. Um, there's a way to not do that. I just haven't gotten around to actually switching the code over. It was just easier this way. But that's why you see this duplicated twice, because one of them is the key pulled out, which could be anything. I just happen to choose the same. Um, I could concatenate the key in the... Uh, and then, so the, the third column is the actual or like item that you clicked on, which in this case is the actor actors. Okay, so that goes in this, uh, so one is the rating that you've selected one. Um, I, I don't give you guys a way right now to, you know, thumbs down or say zero. It's just sort of an implicit, um, you know, but not really. Uh, yeah, so that's the rating uh, gets put in. And then Spark Streaming is out there pulling, and it, this particular job is just storing it in the Cassandra. Okay? So, um, and then from there, so now we're going to go over and become data scientist person over here. So now we're sort of at this, so we're just kind of following this red. So one, two, and three. That's all that's happening right now. So now we're going to become data scientist person. Uh, who is going to connect to Zeppelin. So we got Zeppelin going. Oh, actually, yeah, so from this From this UI, I could actually just follow this step. So, yeah. So this is Zeppelin. So, this, so I've got all these links in here, sort of one in you know one place, just for convenience, so that when we go to build it later, we can just kind of click through. Uh, so for right now, I'm just going to click there and run all. This is the run all right here. Or the run all paragraphs, depending on how good your resolution is here in the upper, uh, the upper left. So I'm going to hit run all. It should be doing its thing, I hope. Okay. Yes, anyone use Zeppelin? Zeppelin Spark, I assume. Right. Or Scala. Okay, so now that I've run, uh, I basically simulated what would be happening typically, you know, in a background job or some sort of you know, cron job, or um, we just wait until the data scientist. So I've clicked the run thing, um, I've done some training. Here I'm just doing top five, so this is non personalized. So this is just total. Um, so sort of talk about the right, like cold start problem when someone new comes into my site, Spark After Dark, I don't know anything about them, I don't have any recommendations for them. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna show the top five. So hopefully, if I click this, okay. So that should match what we see here. Ashley Judd, Tom Cruise, Tiffany Amethyson. Cool. So those, so yeah, that was pretty straightforward. All we're doing here, by the way, is pulling the data out of Cassandra. Let me just quickly show you the code. So we're just getting this data using uh, Spark data frames, passing in the format, which is Cassandra um, in this case, and just doing simple summary statistics on this, and then yeah, joining it with some of the reference data, just. You know, their, their name, the image, things like that, so I can display it properly here. 
doing top K. And then here, I'm going to show you guys this later. This is uh, what I was talking about when I said Netflix has so much confidence in uh, their version of um, right, like Memcache and Redis and things like that. So they've actually, because Memcache, because Redis are not typically the uh, best right, like distributed, um, right, like they're not uh, known as being good like distributed right, systems, right, where, where there's partitioning and you know, things like that. Um, with like consistency, eventual consistency. So things that you would expect out of Cassandra, uh, React, things like that, um, just typically aren't. So like that's not totally true because yeah, I know Redis has been doing uh, like, quite a bit of work there. Um, but it's one of those things, if you're Netflix, you have the cash to actually go out and build these things, right, with your engineers. Uh, you sort of create your own problems when you're at Netflix. You know, it's like, well, I, I, I could probably figure out the Redis or the like, distribution model and maybe contribute back to it, but Fuck it, let's just, yeah, I'll just build my own, right? And then, and then you can plug in anything at that point. So you can plug in anything that's not typically distributed. So they've essentially uh, turned pretty much like any single server system into something like a center. So there's this project called Dynamite, um, and it's actually, uh, so this came out of Netflix, I think maybe uh, the beginning of this year, maybe the end of last year. So here, yeah, I'm essentially sticking this in straight into Redis. So that's the key I'm using, top K, uh, and I'm just converting it into a uh, like comma separated string. Getting it just to make sure. So this is the value that was put into Redis. Um, on your guys' machines, it's a single uh, node Redis, so it's kind of anticlimactic, um, but just really imagine it being. Uh, so here, I'll show you down real quick. Uh, there's a company in Palo Alto that actually formed um, to be sort of the data stacks to Cassandra. It's called Dynamite DB. Um, they're trying to be like the open source or like enterprise support version of this database, so or this sort of framework. Uh, the two implementations that they have out of the box, of course, are Redis and then Memcache, because uh, like Netflix, that's exactly the two that they're using. But One thing about Netflix stuff, all the, the goodies are, are typically buried within the wiki. If you're ever looking for GitHub info, the uh, readme's are usually pretty light. But... Yeah, so here's kind of an outline. Uh, this is multi data center replication, uh, you know, cross region. Um, you can tune the consistency, right? So it's all the things that they expected from Cassandra. Uh, but now this is in memory. And then the thinking is, if you have enough of this, you don't really need to persist, right? We'll just load it all in. If you, uh, at some point, do need to regenerate it, you can maybe go back to you know, some, some old tables or go back through all your you know, like copy logs and uh, regenerate. But if you have nine copies across three different regions and each copy is within its own data center within Amazon, I think you're uh, in pretty good shape. Okay, so. And then on the UI side, when I click this, when I click top five, it's actually doing another uh, rather, um, yeah, like Ajax JSON call, calling into Redis, getting the, the top five that I just put in there. Okay, so that's that's the kind of flow for that that half of it. Uh, let's do. Let's get a little more personalized. A little more personal. Who here is familiar with collaborative filtering, matrix factorization? Cool. Um, let me just kind of give you guys the, the sort of straightforward or like intuition here. And this is actually going to be like the most important diagram. Uh, that we'll keep coming back to because we're going to do quite a bit with this, right? We're not just going to factor this matrix, which is the core of uh, the collaborative filtering, basically. We're actually going to take those factored out matrices and do clustering on them and find similar items, right? Like item to item similarity. Uh, we'll do the same with users. So we'll find users in this group that are similar to each other, right? Now, similarity in this case is based on this collaboration. Right, so 
that matrix on the left, right, that's, a, that's like a whole bunch of uh, like zeros and ones or rather blanks and ones. Um, and then, so that's kind of a current snapshot of what we just did, right? So all that data um, that had gone into Cassandra. We're going to pass that into Spark. Spark is then going to uh, sort of go back and forth, right? Like linear regression, back and forth, hold one side fixed, solve for the other, hold that side fixed, solve for this, um, until it can find two smaller matrices. And yeah, you can choose the size K. It's sort of like choosing K means. Like you don't really know what K is right away. You just kind of iterate and sort of eyeball these, these rather clusters that come out or um, these sort of hidden features that are buried in here, right? So K actually represents sort of latent features they call them. So yeah, it goes back and forth and then until it finds two smaller matrices this way and that way that would multiply together, rather right, together give you as close to that, that snapshot as possible. So that's the sort of intuition there behind matrix characterization. But the cool thing is that we're actually going to take advantage of these item factors. So now, so this is items that are in each column. So this would be like movies or, or our case would be actors, actresses. Uh, down here is users, so that's going to be each of us. Uh, so once we can actually break these down into these, these two smaller factors, I can now represent this item based on these four. Right? I, I, here I, I've chosen K as four. So this is super powerful because now I can represent items, or like a human concept, in a like, numeric format, which is something I can pass into these machine learning algorithms. Right? So I can do K means cluster on these and find clusters within my items. So this is actually uh, rather one of the ways that like Netflix can find all those those super obscure clusters, you know, like uh, Canadian horror slasher films targeted to the ages of 18 to 25, things like that. Yes, yeah, so I have a whole list of them. Um, but yeah, so if you're ever just sort of clicking around Netflix and you're like, yeah, that's a really weird cluster. Yeah, this is sometimes how they're brought about. Like they're not brought about by any uh, pure like metadata. You know, that's on the movies themselves, but it's brought about by this collaboration. Right? Because this matrix has patterns in it. Right? This isn't totally random. Nothing is totally random, right? Yeah, there's a lot of, of you know, skew here, bias here, things like that. So uh, if you could sort of extract those patterns, right, like, which is what we're trying to do, um, this is pretty powerful. Okay, so let me just kind of run through the code. Yeah, once again, pulling out the data from Cassandra, which is basically building up the big matrix. This is the actual ALS. This is called alternating least square. That's the sort of alternating part that you're doing. Uh, you can give it max iterations, which is maximum number of times that you would go back and forth um, as one stopping condition. Uh, you give it rank, so rank is the number, it's, you know, K. It, it's the number of hidden latent features I think exist in this data set. Um, it, it, yeah, it, it, the main way to, um, yes, please don't, please don't run this. Um, but the main way to, uh, if you really want, you know, oh, so if you bumped up K, so right now K is, I think, five, yeah, five. Uh, if you jack K up to, like, a thousand, that's going to be Spark is going to go crazy. I mean, yeah, crazy in a good way, but uh, it's going to try to do a lot of calculations. So keep that in mind that you don't really want to make K too, too large unless you have a rather reason for it. I think, like, yeah, someone said 12 was their magic number. I've heard other people say 20. I've heard you know, other people say you have to just eyeball it. So kind of one of those arbitrary things. Uh, let's see. Here we're just kind of filtering out if you've already given a rating that you're not going to be recommended that, which I don't think actually works. I think I wrote that the other day. Uh, here, we're doing the same thing. So now this is interesting. Um, yeah, I want to point this out. This is a, a, a Redis feature. So once I've generated the recommendations, so this is the transformation right here. This is where you actually pass in uh, what you want. So I've trained the model. Now I've got right, these user item pairs, and I want to get the sort of confidence, right, the prediction for that combination, that user item combination. So the, the output of that, I'm just going to rip through, pull out the prediction. And now Redis, and yeah, fortunately, right, like the Netflix API supports all of the Redis stuff, uh, even hyperlog all of them, um, you know, like some of the more advanced stuff. So not just puts and gets, but actually the full Redis API. Zadd is using these things called sorted sets. So, um, 
you can actually add an item uh, to a set. Right? So like Redis kind of deals with sets of everything, right? It's like lists and sets and things like that. Z add lets you provide this right, like double value, which is sort of the the right, like relative ranking for that set, for this item, for that set. So um, I'm gonna add that that item and user pair and pass it this double, it's gonna automatically sort it within that, that set overall. So now this is super powerful because when I go to retrieve it, it's just one call. I don't have to sort it, I can just get it. This is already sorted. So. Actually, one sort of interesting thing is that it will only, uh, when you put it in, it will always sort it uh, ascending. And the way I want it is actually descending. I want, so when you go to retrieve it, you just make this other call, right? Versus Z range, you call reverse range, and then it gives it to you. You can pass in 0 through 9, that's the top 10 essentially. Um, so, So yeah, these are uh, the recommendations here. So essentially, like when I clicked that link, it was calling back in uh, to Redis and saying, "Get me Z range here." So does everyone understand like what like this is the old, you know there's a ton of code uh, like behind this it's not all JSON calls or early AJAX calls um, so oh yeah so each time that the user would would click uh, it would call in down here so this is the sort of AJAX part right there uh, data scientist person when they ran this uh, Zeppelin notebook actually deployed it out here into Redis now for, like deploy here is sort of it's just it's really generating stuff offline and then just slamming it all into um, some sort of data store. Yes, yeah, so I chose Redis here. Okay, so that's what we're going to build. As a bonus, if we can get through that, which I think we should be able to, I'm going to show you guys something I just got working a few weeks ago. And this is so this is like more of a real-time training situation here. So essentially, as data is coming in, I'm going to be continually training my model. So doing a form of like streaming matrix factorization, right? But, so yeah, this is the whole bread and butter here of, uh, this is what tends to get people excited because that flow I was showing before is sort of boring and you know, it's what everyone does. It's what like Netflix does. And, um, like lots and lots of groups do the offline training and then they uh, like stick it out somewhere to get served up quickly from a Redis or from um, some sort of other uh, mechanism. Okay, so I've started, I've started this now. Can you guys switch over to demo.pipeline dot io slash real time dot html So as you click around here, once this comes up, so now there's two things going on here. I've instead of this UI going directly to Redis, just kind of you know uh, client server model, right? Like I guess you'd say two tiered, um, which could be brittle. Now we're going. I've introduced the Netflix um, things like Hystrix, which are circuit breakers. And, So this is hidden behind a, like, uh, like an Apache URL rewrite so it looks pretty and I can get around the core stuff and all that, but 
Um, okay, I'll show you guys the server side here is right. So this is, um, let me give you a peek into, yeah, so Netflix has this uh, service discovery service called Eureka. That's pretty much the core of all of their uh, services, right? Yes, yeah, so everything registers with Eureka. This is some of the oldest code in kind of the Netflix tool set. This was built initially when they were going from uh, the data center to the cloud, right? Yes, yeah, so anytime that you go to this um, like massive scale, uh, what you need is some sort of, of like service registries so that you can find other services, things like that. This is some of the oldest code, but also some of like the most bulletproof code ever. Um, it's you know quite ugly, and it's gone through I think four or five different versions of like Log4j and SL4j and um, Logback, and uh, yeah, there's like just a lot of that going on. So you'll see here. Here's the prediction service. So that's what I just started up. Um, and then the other thing. So I started up. One piece over here that's called the prediction service. And then right before that, I started up a Spark streaming job that's doing an incremental training. So as data is coming in, it's actually making small tweaks using gradient to sun to make recommendations, right? So every, I think it's uh, three or five seconds or something like that, it's collecting all the ratings that have come in, looking at the current model that's been built since right, during the last uh, since the start, all batches since the start of that job. Um, and then making small tweaks to the ratings. So, and then, but yeah, the reason I showed uh, this Netflix stuff over here is because now I've changed it so that here to here isn't calling direct, is not calling directly into Redis, but it's going through this uh, prediction service. Okay. So, let me actually show you. So this would be like the rest, uh, you know, probably version of it here. It's slash prediction slash, that's the user ID. So this is given a user ID, given one item ID, what's the prediction based on um, this collaboration, right? Not really that useful because typically that's not the use case where you're doing one single user, one single item, but uh, shows you what you can do. Um, I've got this uh, batch version I was actually working on right before I went up here. Uh, where, oh, so the, um, let me think here. Yeah, let me get back to that in a sec, because I have to tell that. Um, okay, so is everyone clicking over here? We, we should be able, oh wait, one thing. There's this cool little curl command that I put together. This is actually going to show the the small changes happening. Right? So as we're clicking around, we'll see. It's just going to keep running this, and then as you guys are clicking around, we'll see the. Uh, prediction change slightly. All right, so start clicking. It's okay, already changed. So it should be about every five seconds or so. I make some small adjustments. It's just making small adjustments in the sort of area that people are, you know, clicking on things like that. Um, all the code. Yeah, so now this is, so um, as, and we should see, if we start clicking here, we should see them change dynamically. Yes, yeah, so are you guys seeing stuff change down here? I'm seeing things. So, th so this is changing, this is actually readjusting its recommendations every batch. Yeah, in similars, there's a bug in the UI where it just dumps out. I think for every single person that you click, it like dumps out a whole bunch. But um, all right, yeah, so there we go. There's, yeah, so now again, these are recommendations. 
uh, based on this collaborative filter. Based on this, this one image here, I don't know what's on So that second set. This part down here, the uh, similar items part, that set is based on just this matrix, just the upper right matrix, just the items. And so what I've done is, um, I'll show the code later, because yeah, we're all going to try to get this working. Uh, should should uh, be working for you guys. Um, I've yeah, I've gone through and then I've calculated similarity. So I've done a Cartesian, which is horrible, but I'm comparing all of the items to all of the other items. You wouldn't do this in like at real high scale, right? But uh, right now, that it was just a quick and dirty way to do it. So basically, what I'm doing, um, if I can remember correctly, it was like a week ago, is I think for every person that you have selected here, I make a call, which is essentially this call right here for similars. I give it the item ID, which um, yeah, each really actor actress has their own specific item ID. And I say, give me zero through nine. So this is doing that. Oh, and so, yeah. So this, that, that Spark streaming job, that's really this thing over here that's uh, doing the incremental training, is also calculating similars. So each batch, it's, it's recalculating new similars. Which you don't do that. You know, yeah, don't. Um, if you do want to do cart or rather Cartesian, rather the whole item to item similarity thing, you would want to look into um, something we'll cover probably this afternoon. Uh, locality sensitive hashing. This is an approximate. This is uh, a way to do the item to item similarity, but not in right, the exact manner. Uh, because what you're trying to avoid is the n squared Cartesian. Right? Just isn't going to uh, really cut it for anything of serious size. So, with locality sense of hashing, right, like the intuition is that you would just go through each item once, so that's O n, and using some sort of min hash function, which is uh, like the most common. Um, actually, this is part of Twitter's Algebraid um, project, which we'll uh, cover. There's about three or four algorithms out of Twitterbird's Algebraid that we'll cover later. Uh, you would go through, you would slot each of these items into one or more buckets, and you can define the number of buckets. You have 1,000 buckets, 50 buckets. So, um, yeah, so each item, it, it could be one or more. And now when you're done, you have 50 buckets, let's say. Uh, now you do Cartesian within the buckets, but it's a smaller amount of data, and you can do all buckets in parallel. If you have like a 50 node cluster, if you want to calculate 50 buckets. Um, so that's that was the way, I mean, you know, like we got this question all the time at uh, like Databricks, you know, once we could get people access to their data with Spark, and they were so excited about it, then they started to run some of the ML stuff, and, um, but their cluster was only, you know, four nodes, because that's all they had budget for. Um, they, these Cartesian, uh, or like item type comparisons just weren't completed. They were just uh, out of memory, or uh, otherwise just, just not coming back. So. We showed them this. Uh, locality sense of hashing has been at uh, Jira and Spark for like two years, I think, something. Um, I like Twitter's Algebra just because I, was using, I uh, was using it for these other things like hyperlog, log, count, and sketch, bloom filters. Um, there's also this project called, was it Mr. Squeeze? Called Spark Hash by Mr. Squeeze. This is based on uh, a really good book. I think it's mentioned here. Yeah, chapter three of Mining Massive Data Sets. Yeah, so you can download chapter three pretty easily. Uh, I 
think Stanford has it. Also, this was a Coursera course, um, I believe, rather earlier this year. Uh, had a lot of people signed up. I was signed up. Um, completely forgot about it. Never watched a single episode. Um, but I would like to go back and watch. Um, yeah, so check out Mr. Squeeze. Check out the sort of intuition behind that, that uh, whole algorithm. Some uh, pretty interesting stuff. So, now that we're, we're calculating finish off the sort of overall architecture that, that we'll be discussing. Um, yeah, so this is where the training of the online models is happening. Uh, oh, if you click on architecture overview right here, which some of you probably are, right below it, so up on top, is the sort of business, you know, yeah, this is like what's happening here, right? We're doing uh, multi random testing, blah, 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 we're storing data. Down here is where I'm actually mapping each of those main boxes that we're going to be covering today to actual code. Um, I, I can't remember how to do image maps or whatever those, those uh, goofy things are. You can click on part of the image and it goes. But you can easily just kind of look at this, pull up the uh, GitHub repo. I'm going to show you the coolest trick in GitHub history. Um, I'll bet you at least half of you don't know about it. Yeah, would you be honest? Yeah, would you raise your hand? Okay. Who knows? Yeah, how would I find a class quickly within GitHub without using search? I know the name of the class. This is the most frustrating thing, especially with, uh, okay, yeah, so watch this. T. And you could do like Kafka, Cassandra. Ooh. That is the biggest time saver ever. It's like way smarter too than the regular, uh, like, you know how the like, GitHub search is pretty shitty? So I do Kafka and Standard, okay, yeah, and this one, there's only a couple in there, so I only return those two, but yeah. But the only time T doesn't work is on the search results page, which is always the time that I want to use it. So, because it's like, I can't, I'm like, oh my god, I should just use T, and then I try to hit T and it doesn't work. So I have to go back there, hit T. Um, it'll search anything, too, I mean, it's not just code, it's read me, and, uh, but yeah, they'll let you filter. So, you can very easily, uh, if you see this class over here is Kafka Cassandra, you would just hit T over here and type Kafka Cassandra. Uh, I believe it works at any level. Does it work within? Uh, okay, yeah, it always bounces back up. Um, if you're looking for this package, incremental, this is what is uh, powering this, this current real time thing. So, let me T this mofo, incremental. Uh, so yeah, this is actually the main class train MF incremental. There's a lot going on in this class, train MF incremental. This is just a, a plain Spark streaming job, but it's doing a shit ton of stuff, and, and this is not not recommended um, for production. Um, you would want to split these out into multiple jobs or even not necessarily do them on the Spark streaming job. In fact, I'm a big fan. I'm, I'm going to get for saying this, but get shit out of Spark streaming as quickly as possible. And if you can avoid Spark streaming, that's even better, because then stuff is already out of Spark streaming. Um, there's a lot to reason through with Spark streaming. There's the Spark, there's the Kafka cluster that you're pulling from and how that's partitioned. There's the Spark cluster where the data's going. There's the receivers. There's checkpointing. Probably none of it quite works well on its own, and together it's for me, anyway, you know, I'm a simple uh, caveman programmer. Like, I can't, you know, reason through that many levels of. Uh... But yeah, definitely be using the Kafka uh, like direct stream. Uh, there's better like parallelism going on there, where uh, it's basically creating a Kafka RDD, so treating or like Kafka itself just like a file system. You know, where think of like Hadoop when it, if you're reading from a Hadoop file system, it's it's breaking it up into blocks or splits or whatever and, and reading them in parallel. So this uh, Kafka direct stream, like the, the sort of best way to describe it is that it's treating it just like a file system, just like the Hadoop, 
from an RDD, but it's, it's splitting Kafka into these different offsets. So when you create the RDD, you're just giving it the offset, and then, right, not the actual data. And then when you then start operating on the data, then it, it, it then goes back to Kafka, and then really it's, it pulls in uh, the from and the to. So then, like, actually, or like, uh, yeah, like pulls that data in. The one problem is it's, uh, you, you can only be in parallel, you can have one partition being pulled in parallel with a second partition, never the same partition or something. Yeah, like there's some kind of limit there to the amount of parallelism. So yeah, just, like just keep an eye on that. So here's where we're kind of starting with a fresh model. I, I could have actually passed in the model that we generated uh, first, but I haven't quite gotten there. So the, the uh, model that we generated offline. So typically the flow here would be to generate a model offline, right? That, that took 36 hours or 24 hours or whatever. You would deploy that, and then throughout the day you would make these small little changes as people are really clicking around, which is what we saw. Right? Those numbers change. I wouldn't change them every five seconds, I'd change them every 15 minutes or something like that. But, um, and then at the end of the day, start that batch job over again and wipe it out and start scratch, or start from the offline generated model. Because what you're doing here is making approximations on other approximations, right? I mean, all this machine learning stuff is approximations anyway. And, uh, so, um, but also, the way that this particular mechanism, because it's using gradient descent, it's actually sort of straying further and further away, right? Which is not what you want, but which is why you want to reset it on the entire data set. Here's where I'm generating. Uh, so here's where I'm actually splitting out the user matrix and the item matrix. I'm storing those into Redis as well. And then the code behind this uh, really prediction here actually gets that like item like factor vector right with the numbers, so I can represent each item now with, with that set of numbers, and then the users uh, set of numbers, and I just do a dot product of them. That's the prediction. So here's where we're doing the all item similarity join, where we're basically pinning each item against every other item, uh, calculating a, a similarity, and then uh, for each item, we're using z out again, which is, um, I can give it the similarity ranking. And then for each item, item pair, uh, that's the ranking. And then my backend service would then serve it up from the similar call here. Okay? Make sense? Everyone kind of with me? Okay. So let's get at it, I think, huh? You guys want? Yeah, time's at 10 o'clock? Okay, it's very good shape. I'm going to send an email. Um, if there's anyone here whose email I don't have inside of right, like the Eventbrite, just, just come talk to me. Yeah, like I don't care like, in terms of, of the sign-up procedure or whatever. I just need to send you guys the, the email with your, your IP and stuff. So uh, let me send this right now. Thank you for listening. So the email should be coming. Um, let's take you know about a ten minute break here to get to get all this stuff set up. Um, 